Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Brave New World is supported by the Center for Data Science, or CDS, at NYU. If your organization is interested in engaging with CDS through student projects, please email cdsindustry at nyu.edu. For more color on the podcast and additional commentary, please subscribe to my newsletter at basantdar.substack.com. There are many problems in the world that are not addressed by markets or governments. They fall between the cracks because you can't put a worth on them or no agency is responsible for addressing them. You can't put a worth on weather, for example, nor can you put a price on how much waste ends up in landfills or in the environment. You can't put a worth on human dignity either, which arguably is one of the most important things for all humans, equal to shelter, food, and clothing. My guest today is Anshu Gupta, who has created an organization called Goonj, which has a unique model that places human dignity and self-actualization at the center of large-scale development while using the world's waste as a nudge for getting there. It's an organization that optimizes the utilization of things to their utmost potential. It's a different kind of sharing economy. In India, the phrase better call goonj is becoming increasingly common. If you have something to give, better call goonj. Sorry, I couldn't resist that variation of Better Call Saul as a Breaking Bad fan. But what motivates someone to do this, to devote their life to making a difference instead of self-aggrandizing like most of us? I'd read a lot about the Goonj organization and what it takes to run it. Imagine running an organization that collects almost everything people have to give. Shoes, clothes, utensils, pretty much anything you can think of and converts this into useful kits for people in their time of need. Goonj is a household name in India. I wouldn't be surprised if it becomes a global name. It's a unique organization doing unique things. Anshu, welcome to Brave New World. I am delighted to have you on the show. Thank you. You know, I usually start by asking people to say a little bit about themselves, but but in this case, I'll ask you to say a lot about yourself because I think it's very relevant to uh, what we're going to talk about. So... Tell us about who you are and you know your organization, what you do, and most importantly, why you do it. So I think as I, as I always tell people that um, someone who is coming from an honest middle class family of India, and I add honest because India has many different middle classes, and for me, the definition of middle class, I mean, that's, that's my definition. I'm not saying that's a universal definition. That is that in those days, if you are able to make your house at the fag end of retirement or after retirement, you're middle class. That, that's an interesting definition. Yeah. There was another one one of my guests used, which was if you struggle to send your kids to school and have to take a loan, you're middle class. <laughs> So that's what that, that was an American middle class yeah. definition. But I'm talking about the Indian middle yeah, class yeah. in those days. And um, my father was with MES Military Engineering Services, uh, a civilian, and a very um, hardcore, very honest uh, government officer. And uh, so by the time I did my 10 plus 2, I had changed seven schools. That's a good proof of it. And... So far, so far, we've got a hundred percent in common. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. No. Yeah. My father was also straight as an arrow. Um, you know. Um, yeah. About as straight as they get. And I changed seven schools also by the time I was ten. Wow. And then they sent me to a boarding school. <laughs> wow. Wow. So I I had the opportunity to even study in Dehradun, you know, which was uh, which has been the hub of education, and my nani, my maternal, you know, grandma was there. But I think it was my it was the decision of my parents, mother and father both, that let's just stay together wherever we are. So uh, we stayed in good places, beautiful places like Dehradun. We also stayed in beautiful places like Banbasa and Chakrata, but those are like far off places. I would say that whatever happened in life today and whatever I am, there's a huge contribution of those few years. When in the morning a kid comes to your place uh, to give you milk, because in those days people used to carry that even in the cities, uh, there were no mother dairies that way. And after a couple of hours, the same kid is sitting next to you and is studying in the same school. 
so for me there was nothing like haves and have nots i mean the way mm-hmm. we all talk about it for me that has been life and that is how the people are and we never knew that it will become such a huge value system for us or such a such a huge learning and the kind of work we will do it will be so you know so relevant for us because there was there was no other life that way after that uh, came to dehradun then met with a massive accident i was on bed for about a year and that also because as i say that i'm i'm a little bit ziddi kind of person that if i have to do something i have to do something and in those days the crazy stuff and the most important part in my life was to look at chitrahar you know and chitrahar was this and so ziddi you would translate for the non um, hindi speakers as Uh, I will not is it does does it have a does it have a precise translation it's one of those hindi words that i find hard to translate yeah same here uh, because you cannot call someone stubborn because that person is ziddi fine i i was not stubborn mm-hmm. fine it is more to do with that if you decide on something you do and then that's how i right i define ziddi yeah Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say determined, but that doesn't say it either. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. You know, because I, I don't know whether we have a word, one single word for Ziddi. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and Chitrahar used to be this song program on, our, on the TV every Wednesday and Friday. So, 3rd June 1987, um, I had just done my 10 plus 2 and uh, uh, that was the day when the Chitrahar was there and I missed the bus and I... Um, you know just just took a lift on a bike met with a massive accident was on bed for one year that was i think another very beautiful thing happened in life and very transformative bed for a year bed for a year i don't think people can appreciate what that is really all about you know i've been in bed in a hospital for a week and it just drove me crazy i had to get out of there so being in there for a year requires a real mental adjustment doesn't it it was it was i i'm sure it was very very complicated for all of us in the family that time and especially when i'm i'm talking about almost like i'm talking about 1987 you know it's like almost 35 years back when the medical science was no you know not so uh, advanced when uh, and then dehradun used to be a smaller town that way you know although it's just about 250 uh, kilometers from delhi but it's still pretty far for 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 the middle class mm-hmm. that way not by distance but by so many other things but i think that one year uh showed me a lot showed me the conditions in the government hospitals uh how the larger uh people live the population live how the people in the mountains live what are those issues and i was not analyzing anything i didn't have any skill of analyzing things but i think once you grow and when you when you look back and when you when all those things which are a part of your memory which are a part of uh, i mean how you lived your life you know i mean that that gives you a lot of strength and also i remember how my father and my mom uh, refused a bribe of 400 rupees um, that particular time and uh, the doctors were very unhappy because the i mean the bribe didn't go through and uh, what was the bribe for so if you have to do a correct surgery if you have to do a surgery it was just like very standard kind of thing that you know just before that you you do that uh but in my place it was absolutely uh, i mean there, there was no discussion about it there was no conversation about it it was not a part of our life mm-hmm. um so it didn't happen and uh, as a result i uh, i live with a foot uh, where i have Uh, 24/7 kind of pain even today and i uh, and i always you know to be honest thank my parents i lost them early but both of them and i always tell people that listen if i if my parents would have bribed i would have been standing on a bribed foot today i stand on my own feet and i never knew that that will become such a huge value system for someone who will end up working on logistics i mean if i talk about goon's work today this is a lot of emotions lot of stuff but at the back end of it it is all about logistics and uh, we often joke that if we didn't pay bribe for the foot how can we pay bribe for the truck 
That that's one of the things I want to get to is is because I wondered about sort of how you deal with all the logistics, but we've got a, a bit of a ways to go before we get there. So what so what was the next stage? Like you obviously, as I've heard, that you had you you and your wife had perfectly nice jobs and something happened. So so continue. Tell us. So if I if I continue from there, uh, that was the time when I started writing. Uh, so in the hospital and bed and all. Otherwise, I come from a hardcore family of engineers of that time. A lot of engineers of IIT, Rudki and all. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I started writing then, uh, and I was also the uh, you know the eldest uh, boy in the family and a girl, two two of us. And then uh, then I did my journalism, which is like first time in the family and journalism in those days used to be risky something it was not like a profession or something sure. for a large number of people it was something like risky something sure i mean if you told your parents you wanted to do journalism exactly think but i think true. i think yeah. i have been very fortunate uh, that way that uh, you know the the kind of parents we got we actually had lot of freedom in deciding things and they were more of a support system I mean, as as caution precaution, they will always advise you. They will always, you know, argue, tell you. But it was not like if we are saying this, that will happen. No, it's not like that. I mean, we had that kind of freedom with us. So I did my journalism, and that was the time when I met this. Uh, in my journalism days, I met with this uh, family, a family which used to pick up unclaimed dead bodies. It's a very different kind of profession. So, like, if you see every single country. and every single big city has large number of homeless and it's very unfortunate that we only talk about delhi bombay or some developing nation but even the developed nation so called developed nation as i always say mm-hmm. uh, also have a large number of homeless people and they come from the villages they come in search of jobs and you know all that and before they settle down they go through a very tough phase mm-hmm. right many of them die they die of hunger lack of medicines lack of care in winters in extreme weathers anything and habib bhai in those days was paid uh, 20 rupees which is almost quarter of a dollar and 2 meter of white cloth per dead body and his full time profession was to pick up unclaimed dead bodies so i was just roaming around on the roads of old delhi i mean which i used to do a i was very foodie and i am still Uh, so the old Delhi gives you very beautiful, very nice, tasty, you know, does. street I have, food. I have fond memories of that. Yes. Absolutely, mm-hmm. and also, uh, you know, this was something in my life that in Dehradun footpath for me were there to walk. In Delhi or big cities, footpath for me, I never imagined that footpath means people stay there. the definitions were changing somewhere mm-hmm. in life i had never seen red lights like this i didn't know that begging happens like this i had no idea of migration i'm a small town kid i had no idea of poverty that way and a whole lot of other things so that's what old delhi was teaching me every day and sitting on my scooter on the on the red light and just observing things was teaching me a lot and then meeting this person and spending like a week 10 days early morning till late night and realizing that his full time job is to pick up unclaimed dead bodies right no other work he does and uh, when i started talking to him of course he spoke in hindi and i'll i'll translate that uh, he said ki jado mein mera dhanda badh jata hai कभी कभी इतना काम होता है कि मुझसे संभलता नहीं सो ही सेड दैट इन विंटर्स इज वर्क गोज अप एंड मेनी टाइम्स ही हैज सो मच अ वर्क दैट ही कैन नॉट हैंडल इट एंड देन आई रियलाइज दैट एवरी ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स इन द रेंज ऑफ फाइव सिक्स किलोमीटर्स वेर एवर ही वॉज एबल टू टेक इज रिक्शा और द और द कार्ट ही वॉज एक्चुअली पिकिंग अप टेन टू ट्वेल्व डेड बॉडीज एंड इन द समर्स इट यूज टू बी फोर टू फाइव and coming from the mountains and the colder region i could relate cold or extreme weather mm-hmm. for months and years i kept thinking that people are dying because of cold people are dying because of cold which all of us you know even people who are hearing this listening this will you know mm-hmm. think like that 
then one fine day you realize that listen if the cold kills people even i would have died fine so i survive on a two wheeler at a speed of 60 70 per hour uh even at 10 pm in the night someone is static dies on the road is actually not cold it is lack of clothing Mm-hmm. clothing which is absolutely important for us clothing which is called one of the three basic need like food cloth and shelter clothing which unfortunately is the first visible sign of poverty or whatever you call i mean you start unfortunately recognizing people whether the person is literate illiterate cultured uncultured poor rich whatever on the basis of cloth can you imagine has never been a development subject is a hardcore relief charity kind of stuff all those the basic need and then i realized that more people are dying in winters due to lack of clothing than earthquake or floods and the family had a little uh, girl 5 6 years old little girl called banu uh, who gave the most shocking statement of course she spoke in hindi and you know in these places the kids grow very fast their understanding because they see the world from the footpath she actually said ki jab mujhe thand lagti hai to main lash ke saath chipak kar so jati hu she says lash tang nahi karti lash karwat nahi milti to she says that when i feel cold i hug the dead body and sleep it does not trouble me it does not turn around and you know uh, my urban education the kind of universities and colleges i have studied fortunately that has always told me that dead bodies are cold they never told me there is something called compulsion they never told me that there is relative need relative utility whole lot of other thing so i kept arguing although i was i was witness to so many things but i still kept arguing that no dead bodies are cold but then you realize that this is also a reality and and you know many of these stories because because my karm movie my workplace is india many of these stories started coming from india but then you started traveling you know in this uh, later part of your life and you find that this is so true for more than half the world i mean if you see ukraine if you see afghanistan if you see so many crises which have happened in the last 2 3 years every where we were worried more worried about weather and winters and what people are wearing and all that kind of stuff but it is still not a subject so that's how absolutely unknown territory in uh, unknown space the journey started i still moved on to my as i say corporate career but all these things were troubling and maybe the bigger trouble which happened to me was with the tie and the black shoes which i didn't want to wear anymore and that's where this happened that i am leaving my job in 1998 minakshi uh, my and, wife and, and where were you at the time what what job was that and where were i you? was with the escorts mm-hmm. so it's a um, as we say the indian corporate or indian multinational you can say mm-hmm. and i was looking after corporate communication and minakshi my wife around that time had joined bbc we both are otherwise batchmates and she was looking after media relation for the south asia uh, bbc so i think the decision was that now one person will earn the other person will spend and spending was my role mm-hmm. and that's how the journey started and and we were married for about 3 years and we said that uh, anything which we have not used can we just take out that and uh, say except those marriage wedding dresses we were able to take out about 67 units of clothing shoes or whatever and that's how uh, it started so is that how gunj got started the organization this is how gunj started we didn't know that we are setting up an organization we didn't know that you have to get it registered and this is there is also this way of doing it but the only thing is that on or say say one part you found certain gaps on the other part you found that yes there is this resource there are there are these this this material uh, which can take care of that and 
right literally i mean you'll not believe till 2003 from 1998 for 5 years we were literally operating from home obviously we didn't have money to uh, take a stores or hire people or whatever whatever but for 5 years we were just running from home we were just collecting and reaching out to people collecting and reaching out to people so before i ask you you know how you built the organization i have to admit that this is most unusual right the reaction of most people including myself would be ah oh, i don't want to deal with this stuff you know it's just like can't deal with it i need to get away from this right and i need to like get a better life quote on quote better right whatever that means and in your case you just you did just the reverse right you it, it's you know your reaction was i can't walk away from this so i think one very important part is that it's not that it's not a better life but that's why i put better in quotes uh, with my hands it is also yeah. a very beautiful life yeah and i think i find uh, or rather we find ourselves very privileged that at that stage in life we found a purpose in our life okay absolutely unknown territory there was no background neither from inakshi's side nor from my side if i see the education and the family backgrounds we didn't even know that there's something called social sector mm-hmm. uh you know that way and, and you can really work like this but this was absolutely unknown space and 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 a beautiful journey of course a complicated and a tough journey uh, in the in the initial phase to start with and and till date till date you know i think one of the important part about working in this sector or the, or this space is you handle grief you and that's that's a very complicated work yeah all other businesses all other work look for a happy person yes where you can sell your services or where you can sell your product this is one of the rare space where you you're where you're not looking for very happy people did you have any doubts at all about whether this was the right no. way to go no no because there was no way to go mm-hmm. there was no defined way to go so there was no question of doubt it is something like you have started something now you are just working on something every day uh, you are learning every day you are evolving what we are today we never imagine how we do today we never imagine it's all evolved it's all evolved with the with the wisdom of hundreds of people fine it i mean the fine the credit comes to us but there are large number of people who just keep who who had faith in this entire system who started working who started sorting processing loading creating something out of it experimenting with those things and and these are the people who used to get like 80 rupees 100 rupees a day in those days fine even then they were a part of it because they were also they were also finding something different they were finding that is more of a very professional but again the atmosphere is of a family we stand with each other we celebrate with each other we sit with each other there's no there are no separate cabins there are no separate tables there are no separate utensils for the for the sirs and the madams and the yeah, yeah. and the team yeah. so so i think what happened is that because we didn't know anything about it 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 was a much bigger fun that way yeah there's so many things i want to ask you at the same time you know because you know you talk about the role of dignity and the importance of dignity um in people's lives even when you're poor maybe especially when you're poor but say a little bit more about that and also tell us about the progression of gunj and where you are now and you know what you've seen as some of the biggest challenges in in getting to where you are now so one thing which we really need to understand is no one who is poor i think that 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 poor word needs to go away and that's something which i'm doing in my parallel next journey called gram swabhiman which is about the self respect of the of the village people so i go and i tell people that listen i don't know how to do farming i don't know how to sing i don't know how to sw- swim i don't know i i can run a car but i don't know how to do a tractor so am i not poor so you call people financially poor mm-hmm. if they are financially poor but let's not label poor people poor no one is poor number 1 number 2 when we talk about dignity lot of people come to goon come to us and say goon gives dignity to people you give dignity to people i always object and i say that listen we cannot give dignity to people 
every single person whatever caste community religion uh geography economy you are you are born you're there with dignity no one can give you dignity the society can only do two things either it takes away your dignity or it respects your dignity and dignity is very important because that's the biggest asset all of us have in common whether we have eyes whether we have legs or not but we have dignity that's the inner thing but society keeps challenging it when you call someone poor when you call someone unskilled how do you call farmer unskilled 7 8000 different variety of rice someone you know innovates you call that person unskilled me and you the so called literate we give a lecture for 15 minutes on agriculture which we have never done we are skilled how does it happen that when i put in my time i am a donor or a giver when the community gives time there are still beneficiaries when i put in my skill or my time i am again a donor when the community spends time in doing something there are still beneficiaries so i'm talking about these language and lenses how we are looking at the at the world because we we want to be we want to be there up somewhere you know i do this exercise in many lectures all across the world not only in india and i ask people that listen come and uh, speak for 2 3 minutes 4 minutes use your hand and use the word donor and beneficiary as many times as you can almost 100% time professor donor is up here beneficiary is down there mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and then you go to the world and talks about and you, and then you talk about equality how does it happen it's not there with you and if it's not there with you how will you give it how will you share it so we said that if you talk about the second and goods what what are the main part of gunjas um so we collect cloth utensils footwear doors windows wash basin anything and everything you know from all across it is underutilized or it is oversized undersized whatever now as i said that it has been the most charitable object subject across the globe i mean 90% of the charity stops by giving your second hand material and and we go in the market and say i want to donate cloth i want to donate shoes and we said listen i think we somewhere need to change right i mean something which we have already used for 2 years with what right are we calling it donation it is a discard we are giving it because we don't need it mm-hmm. yeah so let's be let's be thankful to the people who are using our second hand material because they are the keepers of our emotions they are the keeper of our hard and money and all the time money energy we spent in finding a beautiful color for our t-shirt in the busiest schedule they are the keeper of that so you need to be thankful to those people instead of creating a hello here and say i am a donor no you are not and it was it was a complicated game prof because our work our entire work depends on second hand material and you are going to the same people and saying that listen this is not a donation say we are giving it don't say i am not saying that say we are discarding it because if you if you give it with a discard mindset god only knows what will come to us so let it let it come with a share mindset let it come with a give mindset mm-hmm. not with a donation or discard mindset so now all this material come to us and then across the country in many many you know, areas it, it it's an it, it gives a, a different meaning to the sharing economy you know the, 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 this is a different kind of sharing it right? is yeah I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you. No 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 yeah. not at all not at all. So uh then it goes through a very rigorous process of matching the need. It's not just about sorting processing but matching the need because the biggest problem with the donation mindset is that we give what we have we don't give what people need. Okay? Mm-hmm. And in a country like India and not only in India across the globe the biggest asset of all of us is our diversity. You know I mean uh a lot of people must have traveled to those five southern indian states now all these states are touching border with each other all of them eat rice 
but all of them eat different variety of rice there's a beautiful very tasty dish called sambar which is a mix of various vegetables there every single southern state is eating sambar ingredients are almost same the taste is different you see mm-hmm. and that's the most important aspect when you start working with people you know, because you need to understand that it's not it, you, you can't impose whatever you have you just give it away so it goes through a very rigorous process of matching the needs of people where and what is needed and then it is converted into large number of kids family kids menstruation kids school kids anganwadi kids so many other other kids and so then, so how many different types of kids i think we have about there? 20 different kind of kids okay. though mm-hmm. and these you found to be standard kinds of things that are that that people need yes so if you are talking about the mountains of india and when we are talking about women and women say footwear we will not talk about sandal or the normal footwear we will always and always talk about the sport shoes otherwise you don't relate sport shoes with the women unfortunately okay but that's what they need mm-hmm. so we've gone to that particular level mm-hmm. to see what is i mean of course we cannot match everything but as much as possible uh, we need to do that and these are very specific kits so school kits are made for school kids so all the school related material will be there education related material will be there family of 4 to 6 size kind of family with clothes utensils some dry ration or whatever we are collecting that way we don't we don't want to procure more we want to collect more because the whole idea is that uh all these words are bu- you know very big buzzword like circular economy and all that kind of thing these are new words in our life right but when we started these words were not so common uh what we are talking about is the optimum utilization what we are talking about is that let's start imagining a a water bottle as a living being and say the water bottle will enjoy the city life for 6 months then enjoy the village life for 6 months or a community life for 6 months in a different community take care of the needs of two different communities and then it will be recycled but the most important part is that you do the proper utilization of something before you dump it or before you recycle it that's the whole concept so that's where with these kits we go to the villages of india and the slums also this is where the dignity part comes because what we need to understand that at the end of the day charity kills dignity of people sustained charity i'm talking about instant charity is fine if someone is hungry you feed it is okay right now and without dignity you cannot think of any development because you kill the self of someone and if my self is killed my soul is killed what will my body do and so this is how this this material is as i say in hindi it is called aladdin ka chirag which lot of people know you know uh it is is something like a magic where you go to these villages and then you sit with them and you start talking what are the issues someone says that we need a road someone says we need to uh, dig a well clean a pond make a bamboo bridge hardcore water sanitation infrastructure work with their wisdom with their local resources hundreds and thousands of people work on those issues solve those issues and then after doing that with lot of uh, respect they receive that family kit right what happens a the barter economy is revived in a big way on one side you have the under utilized material of one part of the society on the other side it is the wisdom and the hard work of the other part of the society second you have additional resources now which was otherwise a part of the landfills or charity is like a currency now is like a resource is like a reward for this third we are able to take care of lot of issues which otherwise do not you know come in the list of development work 
there are no budgets for that and fourth i would say the most important part the decision making is now in the hands of people for whom decisions are being made and that has been one of the biggest gap across the globe someone who is will not be affected by this someone who will not use a village road will decide how that village road will be made that's a normal way of doing it mm-hmm. in this model not only what kind of road but whether a road or not will also be decided by the community they will decide what is their need what is their want there's a huge debate on this so how do you help with something like that i see the kits you know if if people have lost something that you know you 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 provide these kits how do you help people with these sort of infrastructure projects how does your organization get involved in that so we we are the catalyst in the entire game we we sit with people we work with them to identify the issues we motivate uh to tell people that you can solve it you can make a road and this is how the community will work we do not go and say the people who know how to dig a well come no and and this includes working out the finances and how is you know how how people are actually going to get paid so so they are they are actually paid in kind uh-huh. that's the fun of it so we are saying that for large part of your uh, year earn as much as you can say in money in the harvest season to the government schemes whatever or wherever you can earn money do that in the remaining days start earning in kind start and by solving your own problem you're not working for a contractor or for government but you're working for yourself because the the problem area is identified by you so like even in the pandemic time we were able to repair or make almost about 300 kilometers of village roads and that's their skill that's their need so we just work as as catalyst there we just work to nudge and how do you decide what to do which where where are you going to devote your attention is it going to be that village in rajasthan or that village in bihar or what what drives this decision what will happen in the village we will not decide that is something the community will decide right what area we will work as a team we keep changing keep deciding on various factors right from disaster to poverty to you know the need identified by the team or or when we are connected by the villagers all across right but how do you prioritize your attention in the first place who you're going to attend to as far as possible so one of the one of the mantra of gunj is that go to the last point and then try to come back and also you know i think we all know that even in the uh the the most progress nation if you even go like 100 miles to 100 miles away you start looking at different things so in india also it operates like that and then there are large number of areas where you have uh, regular disasters from drought to cyclone to floods and those are so those are the areas which need absolutely regular attention i mean where the floods have almost become a ritual where people don't even pay attention the outside world mm-hmm. and they say the no no every year it happens but when something happens every year that those people actually need much more attention every year that way and then you have tribal belts then you have we also uh, you know we 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 came out with this term called missed out communities so if you talk about uh, people with leprosy people with physical disabilities or other disabilities uh, transgender sex workers so there are there are a lot of lot of areas where where you know these communities stay and especially the tribal people so those have been our focus area right from the beginning and and our work area is pretty remote so i've got two related questions why don't markets and industry sol- you know, solve these problems you know do they fall by the wayside because you know sometimes markets don't address problems because they can't be priced you can't put a price on something like weather climate right markets ignore those because you can't put a price what's what's clean air worth right so let's just ignore it it's someone else's problem part of my question is what's 
is is there a profit oriented solution to this problem you know where a market would incentivize some organization to say you know what let's go just let's just go around collecting things that people have decided they don't need flip side to that question is what's your business model how do you support what you do you know we haven't talked about how many people you have you know but these things cost money you need kits Wait, wait, where does your funding come from that enables you to do this? So, very crude answer to your first question is that uh, many times these problems are created by the market. Let's be very honest about it. These large number of these problems are created uh, not just because of the profits, but because of the greed. And we all are, we all need to be answerable to these things, you know, and especially many of us are saying post covid and that is maybe true for me and you but for a large number of people in the world there's nothing like post covid it's all with covid because for them covid was not limited to health crisis you know there's much larger thing with which they've gone through and they will go through and i always say that you know the the conversation 2 years back i mean before covid started and the conversation now need to need to be different these can't be same and very unfortunate that wherever we go the conversations are same because we think that life is normal business as usual no it is not the covid came and and it gave us a chance to to relook into things and to to realize that what worked the defensiest biggest airports work or the smallest possible road worked what worked what didn't work mm-hmm. we wanted the biggest possible hospitals or we wanted much better public health system but we don't want to accept all that thing because we are still profit driven we are not people driven right so you're saying that the market would probably solve the wrong problem to begin with of course because unfortunately unfortunately market that's what i in the beginning i said that we you're you're looking for a customer every time you're just looking for a customer mm-hmm. so for you people are customer right they're not just a customer they're people because we need roi immediately mm-hmm. and change will not give you roi immediately change is a process what we are into it will take our lifetime to get something but will something will happen So I think this 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 needs a fundamental shift and and a very honest answer that why why did we suffer so badly with one virus and we saw millions of people going back to the roots which is the villages which is the smaller places but will we keep using villages just for the benefit of us that if you have good monsoon grow for us if you do not have monsoon migrate and make houses for me how did it happen the people who have been feeding us remained hungry how did it happen that people who made houses for us were walking on the roads we need very we need answers but we are not even raising questions i always feel that some people have to pay for such work because they will never go to the villages and work they might be the biggest possible product designer software designer we don't need their skills in those villages for millions of people across the country it's important for them to put in their money so our business model is very simple the model is that everyone brings something to such kind of work someone brings labor someone brings a skill someone brings material someone brings money whatever you have put it in and that's how the good work happen uh you know this havan you know very well which is holy fire or whatever we call it and i always equate it with it and i say the beautiful part about i'm not a, i'm not a religious religious person but you know this is something i always admire about this havan thing and i say that 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not either, but there's something sort of something, interesting about rituals and rituals. special about it. Yeah, and, 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 and Havan has so many components, okay? So it has wood, it has that, you know, the, that, that material which you put, it has matchbox, it has, uh, it has so many other things. Ghee. Ghee and all that. And we all need to understand that Havan is happening because all those components are there. The day that matchstick thing that this havan is happening because of me, that means that a stick actually forgot that if that a stick tries anything in isolation, you will have a blanket or, a, or some water on it. That is exactly the story of such kind of work. None of us should have that arrogance that it is happening because of me or if I move out, it will not happen. It will happen. And we all need to contribute to this. No one is asking people, how are you making so much of profit? Everyone is talking about the money which after making profit is shared for these causes. So if no one is asking, these people need to ask themselves. One of my questions was, you know, are Indians givers? You know, are Indians good givers? Listen, it's not just about India. It's about the world. Yeah. Number one. But, 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 but actually, to, to that question, I'll, I'll extend that to the rest of the world. You know, you've traveled the world. You know, do you find differences in behaviors or tendencies of people to give? But put that question aside a little bit. Just carry on. So sorry again no, for that So what I'm saying is that when we talk about the world, and of course India, a major part of it, it's a very, very either the large part of the money go to the religion or to the faith or a huge amount of resource actually are event-based giving. And I always wonder, and I've been questioning this, that why do you need a flood or earthquake to stand with people? Poverty is a disaster. Poverty is one of the biggest disasters and an ongoing disaster. Why is it not, why it is not bothering us? Why we still keep waiting for, for a flood, an earthquake or cyclone or something? And that's one of the biggest problem. That's one of the biggest problem across the globe. You study data of any country and you will find religion, faith and event. How many people are really working to make sure that no one remains financially poor? At least even if you aim in that direction, you will not wait for your money or your resources to, you know, uh, I mean, for, for, for some event. So it's again, it's a, that's what I've been, I've been arguing again and again, that there is, what you need is a fundamental shift and, and the acceptance that with all of our good intentions, I'm not doubting on intentions of anyone, with all of our good intention, somewhere we failed. Is it not the right time to sit with ourselves and accept that? And with the same intention, Change the strategy, relook into the world and ourselves, and do it. And I'm sure something will happen. I mean, you will accept, you know, Prof, that, and this is something I've been telling people that if you have, if you have food in your plate for dinner, if you have a place to go in the morning, the school, college, or your workplace, if you went to the hospital and came back, if you didn't go to the hospital, is it not your second birth? I understand this because I have gone through very tough phase and many of our colleagues and family members have gone through that phase mm. and I consider it my second birth. And and if 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 I'm privileged to have this second birth and if I'm privileged to see what has been happening around and if I'm privileged to have something to share with the fellow citizens and if I understand that I have to pay back, it's not about giving back. I'm sure things will settle down a lot. And every single individual can do that. And you don't need systems for everything. All these talks about if I give something, whether it will go to the right place or not. These are excuses. Fear it. You know, ordinary people like us, 
can only do something for five people, ten people, fifteen people, hundred people. In this big world, in the era of Google, with two cars with us, we can't find those two organization or hundred people. Is it so complicated? We can find a good eating joint hundred miles away from us. We can find a good, beautiful place to stay. When we go on holidays, we can find two good organizations in our life to work with. It's all excuse. As I always say, logic is largely for not doing something. Doers never look for a logic. It is uh, quite amazing how easily we can look away, isn't it? It is. That's the easiest thing to do. Mm. And and when you look away, you put something on someone. You never say that I don't want to do it because I don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do it because that person is not this that whatever. So you always when you look away, you put it on someone else. You know, it's interesting that you you mention and it's obvious in retrospect that people will be motivated to give when there's a disaster, but not the rest of the time, you know, that the that they can live in a completely opposite mode for the rest of the time and be and be extractive, you know, just sort of the opposite of giving. I don't know maybe it's a question of awareness right maybe 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 people just aren't aware sufficiently of this behavior where they find it so easy to easy to look away you know maybe a mo- more of an awareness would awareness about about oneself about oneself oneself yes. otherwise yes. um what is happening in the world uh, everything is visible there's nothing which is invisible the the state of the world Yeah no and exactly I I was talking about awareness because it's uh, it's so easy to distract yourself yeah. you know and and sometimes i feel like we sort of go through life distracting ourselves because it's easy and it and, and we're doing something yeah and you were talking about better thing you know i so a lot of people now come to us to to me mini and all and say no uh, you you've done so much of sacrifice and all that you know because this this is how the notion is mm-hmm. yeah and we always ask people that listen uh, uh, how come we don't see any sacrifice here yeah because maybe uh, two 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 huge houses or every three years a different car or the or the latest version of iphone is not what we aim for there's no sacrifice there that's not something which we which which gives us happiness in any case in our life uh, when you buy something it is to change something at a certain point i mean you can only have one dining table at your place you see and it's not that we are not roaming around in cars or we are not wearing good jeans and all that fine it's just that we are not changing every month so so i and and, and why we don't call it sacrifice because you know i i always feel that uh, the people who have any kind of dream are very privileged and then they're further lucky and privileged if they're able to work on their dreams and they are the luckiest prof if their dream is in the right direction i'll never say i'll never claim that i'll be able to fulfill my dream because every day it becomes big but i'm happy that it's in the right direction i'm not claiming that we are making any change we are making this impact all these 100000 lives change is is one of the biggest joke on this earth i mean it is done by the people who are not able to change their own life in their lifetime and then then by distributing something you claim on the cover page of your presentation 100000 life change so i'm not in that race yeah no in fact you know uh, we were talking earlier before this conversation just on the side about you know what keeps one motivated to do this you know and and you know the the obvious question is you know are you moving the needle you know i mean that's sort of it's just such a standard business term right yeah. Yeah. and if you do something people say you know are you moving the needle you know and that is such a strange question i mean i it's exactly where it comes from but for someone like you it's such a strange question you know are you moving the needle but do you ever think of that like am i moving the needle like you know how, how much of an impact am i making i mean do you think of things like that or we do it's not that we don't yeah. fine Uh, we are not very sticky about it but every every day you talk about you you want to see something happening and to me uh, 
I think the definition of change or or moving the needles and all is that when more and more people start um, trusting themselves. You know, one other thing which I often now in the villages I've been talking about it in this Gram Swabhiman thing. When you say trusting themselves, you mean about their own self worth, self worth, self power, self skill. Mm-hmm. self everything mm-hmm. okay yeah. because that is what that is what is losing so 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 just imagine um, your childhood and if i imagine my childhood there was at least one kid in our families or in the colony where the entire family or colony uh, used to call that kid slow or say no he will or she will not respond if you send her to the market or her him to the market he'll take like 2 hours okay mm-hmm. the kid is perfect okay kid the kid has its own his own pace but the entire world and the ecosystem told that kid that you are slow you are black yeah. you are white yeah. mm-hmm. all that kind of thing slowly a very small part of those kids will come up as rebellions and they will and their life in proving something unfortunately and most of the kid will accept that i feel that this is what the so called powerful and so called literate people like us have done to the larger world where we told them that you are poor you are unskilled this is not the right way of wearing this is not the right way of sitting this is not the right way of talking you are under privileged you know and so, that's where these communities have are losing faith you know so you remind me of a conversation i had with one of my guests about a year ago james robinson who has written these very interesting books uh, co-authored uh, why nations fail in a narrow corridor and he devo- devotes a fair amount of his attention to india mm. and you know he talks about the sort of headwinds in india as deriving from a really complex social structure you know the caste system the fact that there are so many gradations and and things like that and and what you were saying earlier sort of reminded me of that you know because that's also something that says here's where you are and here's where you belong and here's where you should think and here's how you should behave to what extent do you think that's getting in the way of dignity and self worth listen these are these are different power structures and power structures are always created by the powerful people okay so it's 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 very easy to talk about the indian caste system and community system which i agree is a is a problem but look at large number of nations and say where which are those nations where you do not have certain kind of this power structures or caste or communism you might not be calling them caste how do you go to us and and say black as as a word or say brown as a word how do, how do you do that because because there is power in that Sure, you're saying it just takes a different form. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different, different form. form. Yeah, I think in in many countries, including India, for me, what matters is is a very very low benchmarking of life, of the things we should have, the way we should live. the 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 benchmarking is so low that we are not understanding our worth. We are not understanding that we all have have a right to live a good life, better life. in a better way right and that is where the moment any kind of power structure comes it is it is suppressing it further so i agree that there is there are issues with the caste community and religion you know issues but that is not limited to india yeah i think many countries who are talking about these things need to look into themselves also and and it's not a good thing i'm not i'm not saying that these are good thing these things need to go away immediately Everywhere. so do you think of how you can amplify yourself ha huh. so 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 to be honest that's not the that's not the idea of amplifying it 
and that is the reason i said that when people start understanding their own power when they start trusting themselves when they have faith when they know that they can also do it so those thousands and millions of people with whom we have worked they know that they can make a road right so you're saying that that is the amplification that is. right so amplification a, yeah. has to happen of the idea and the ideology right not of the organization well uh but how can those two be independent right that that in in order to replicate something that you've done in one place in a hundred places that are still needing it you know the, the in in my sort of naive thinking there's two ways of doing it one is that you have lots of people who are aware of this problem and do what you're doing but that's not the case because most people don't think like you do and are motivated by more material things than you are so so to me amplification means more of what you're doing right which you must think of right i mean yes. you know surely you must feel like gee i could do so much more you know am i doing enough like is this all no no so that's a that's a everyday thought prof but yeah. the fact also remains that we should also know that this world is absolutely absolutely full of good people there are a lot of people who are just uh, as we say sitting or standing on the fence and the moment they they see some idea working and they see some ideology matching they just jump on it and i think in the last two decades of this work we have seen enough cases like that where we say that partial or the part of it is gone to those people the language is changing those lenses are changing so i think people like us need to work more on on changing those very fundamental stuff material as a currency or as a reward and all that is these are these are just a few outcomes there are many many more outcomes which people will be having but if you if you shift that basic narrative if you make a dent on those lenses and language if you go to larger public spaces and say that how long will we sell poverty to remove poverty why do you need a naked kid to collect money to remove you know that so called poverty of that kid mm-hmm. why do you have to show those absolutely nasty picture of hungry kids to 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 get money for the hungry kids because that's 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 the language of the advertising you you sell products with that in some cases but not like not like showing all this you can and and at least in the last two decades we have we have proven that with this 1500 people whatever we we try to do full time and then hundreds of partner organizations across the country uh, we have never sold poverty we have never shown a naked kid in our communication and it is it is basically challenging the very fundamental thought process around looking at people how does it happen that when you buy a sanitary pad for yourself you look for a black polythene or a newspaper to wrap it but when the sanitary pad is given to the community you want a picture of that lady to put on the facebook i think my role to amplify all this is that so there is this evidence so whatever we are talking we are not talking in air there is huge amount of evidence for that i am spending my time in talking i am spending my time in challenging the very basic thoughts i am spending my time in reminding people that uh covid gave us a chance to relook and and many times these are very lonely voices but that's how it grows also So Anshu you know you your organization has received you know numerous awards are you approached by philanthropic organizations that want to get involved and put the wind at your back uh, and and sort of I'm 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 continuing sort of with this theme of amplification right that uh, do, are are you you know being approached by organizations like that that would like to be associated with you and help you so large number of organizations work with us fine i mean we are also because at the back end of this work is 
हार्डकोर लॉजिस्टिक दी सैलरीज दी रेंटल्स दी ट्रांसपोर्ट एंड एवरीथिंग इट्स अ हार्डकोर लॉजिस्टिक जॉब एंड एंड नाउ यू रिमाइंडेड मी विद दैट आई वांटेड टू कम बैक टू दिस लाइक सो डिस्क्राइब एंड आई एम सॉरी टू सॉर्ट ऑफ टेक यू ऑफ टेंजर बट बट आई रियली डिड वांट टू एड्रेस दिस सो डिस्क्राइब लॉजिस्टिकल कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी ऑफ एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन लाइक दिस ओह सो वन इंपॉर्टेंट पार्ट इज दैट नो there are no two things which are like absolutely same correct yeah yeah it's, this is not a factory no yeah. it's not a factory so right. so you you get all shape sizes color kind of material to us and that's what we took to be honest as a as a challenge so like like i'll give you a very simple example so there used to be this lot of audio tapes and video tapes everywhere it used to be used and now we don't need it and it used to come to us so the easiest solution is to sell that in plastic right but uh, when you sell it in the plastic there is tape which is not recyclable mm-hmm. right and we said that okay fine the singer is recycled in the world the plastic is also recycled in the world what about that tape and i mean to be honest we we kept it for a few years you know because not every idea comes i mean idea also has a certain time when it comes and then we started weaving that tape in the looms hand looms now it has become a very beautiful fabric now we are short of those cassettes that way because we know that cassettes have their own life uh, after a certain time it will not be visible in this world and those uh, those that that fabric is actually used to create very beautiful conference material lot of other products which we promote in the market so we looked at every single item and said that we will not say no we will only say no to a used shit pot or maybe a very bulky sofa set because we know that it is not usable at our space rest everything we'll just we just want to have it so that we we experiment with it because the idea is not just to send whatever we are collecting but also to take care of this entire wastage in the world because you know i mean that that uh that landfill is also a huge concern for us Sure, and I'm I'm sure there are plenty of people saying, "Hey, let's call Goonj." Everywhere, I mean, yeah. so so uh, people have Goonj corners, people have Goonj bags, Goonj cartons, where they keep doing it. Hundreds and thousands of volunteers keep organizing camps. A lot of big brands, um, the the national international brand, uh, do a co-branded campaign with us. For that, we charge them also because they're using our logo, you know, uh, and and that they cover the logistics cost. A lot of foundations and corporates are now understanding our concept. Earlier, they only used to think that we are in the we we collect and distribute clothes, you know, the, because that's the that's the normal notion with the second hand material, and that's the normal notion with the cloth, and that is what is happening across the globe. You collect and you distribute. You collect and you distribute. They never understood that it's like a currency for us. It's like a I mean, mm-hmm. with your old cloth, you can actually make a road, not by putting that cloth in the road. but by using that cloth as a cloth mm-hmm. as a clothing material so now people have started understanding for sure i mean um, uh, we were not very upfront in uh, in communication for sure i think uh, i would call it a little bit of failure that uh, we were not able to do uh, the kind of positioning which should have happened of this work it took us lot of years because we were so busy in our in our field in in tackling disasters yeah, which are so things. frequent in doing things yeah. so somewhere although we come from the field of communication but uh, me and vinakshi and many of us in the team we always feel that we somewhere failed in positioning it in the right way but it also a little bit of saving grace is our uh, hardcore philosophy where we said that there are two ways of working one is that uh, you talk about the work and second is that the work talks about you and we are the believer of the second one uh, i think wo th- i think it's is is uh, uh you can say it's a stretched a little bit and that's the only wrong thing which happened so aren't you have um any universities expressed uh, an interest in working with you uh, on the kind of work that you do so a lot to be honest earlier um, as volunteer or or you know as a speaker and all that but more importantly recently now uh, after a lot of hard work uh, howard has finished a case on us 
uh, it will be released very soon um, so prof and team have really really worked very hard because it's also they also found that they accepted there's a bit of unusual kind of work so a lot of those business mindset need to go away then then something happens so this harvard case study is almost ready and will so be this out. is a harvard business school case harvard business school that's awesome uh, yeah. that's uh, i'd i'd be very curious to see it when it comes out you know i use hps cases in my classes sometimes oh, okay no, so um, and the other thing which is happening is that after a lot of work um, you know uh, now we also in the next couple of months we'll have a proper curriculum uh for many universities and it's a credit course kind of thing which we all are developing and this uh in a unique way it is largely created written uh by the team the practitioners who have been here for last many many years so they have picked up the topics i mean in a structured way and then they wrote about it so it is it is more of a case study because our life is all about case study fine we mm-hmm. whatever theory we are talking about those theories are coming out of our practices it's not that that we have a theory and then we try to do it yes. so it's, it's a little bit of reverse yeah yeah no in fact uh, you know my my last guest the president of northeastern university called this experiential learning yeah. right that yeah. that you go into the field and it's not just getting some work experience while you study it's actually a way of focusing your inquiry and the kinds of questions you ask yes. you know so that there's sort of a natural synergy that's derived between the classroom and the real world so couple of months that will be out and we will our our team and the partners and so many other people will also become a little bit of faculty to to talk to hundreds and thousands of students all across the country and the globe and then um, we will also co-author a book on this course so that's also is happening so i think in the last couple of years we uh, it is delayed because of covid because covid of course we had to uh, respond in a completely different way and i'm happy that we did that in a in a good way um, now we are coming back to all this knowledge management and how do we uh, amplify uh, what we are trying to do what you just spoke and fortunately in that particular phase lot of universities have shown interest and uh, harvard is doing a case and and many other cases are also coming up so let's see what happens in the next one year awesome great stuff. Well, Anshu, you know, this uh has been a fascinating conversation. I've just learned a lot just reading about you, reading your materials and now uh talking to you. You know, it's uh it's just a whole other way of looking at the world and I just really want to commend you for um running with it and and making a difference. So, thank you. I call it the I call it the journey of non-issues. Okay, I don't call it the journey of issues. So clothing has been non-issues. The menstruation, which we started talking about, we are the first people to talk about it in India. Mm-hmm. That how women are forced to use sandals, jute bags, rags, rags, anything, because of lack of a piece of cloth. Mm-hmm. That has been a non-issue. Uh, the uh, involving the so the so the last person for whom you are making a decision as a stakeholder is also a non-issue. dignity unfortunately prof most of us are talking about dignity but most of us do not practice that that's really worth keeping in mind isn't it absolutely uh, the practice of it absolutely it's one thing to talk about it and be aware of it it's quite another thing to exercise yes. and be aware uh, of it exactly well anshu thanks again it's been a pleasure uh, talking thank you thank you so much same here